Tremendous, tremendous truth. And my, what a faithful God we have. He was here 92 years ago. He's still here. Amen. And um, leading, guiding, blessing, helping. And I'm thankful for that. I want to look in our Bibles tonight just for a few minutes. Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Uh, while you're turning there, let me say thank you, uh, church, for having us and uh, special celebration, uh, uh, celebrating the anniversary of the church here, and we're honored to be here. Thank you for the nice place uh, that you put us up in, and uh, my just beautiful place. And um, walked in last night. There's food all over the, all over the counters, not open food, unopened food. Some of you looked at me shocked, like, what? Food? No, no, it was clean, but just all kinds of food, and uh, there was even balloons. There was balloons, and um, so thanks for that, and, um, and just a wonderful meal we've just had. What a, what a great blessing. Uh, so we're, we're very happy to be here, and our home is in New Brunswick. How many of you have been to New Brunswick? Okay, I ask that everywhere I go, this is the best response I've ever had. Um, Because usually I'm asking that in the States and people don't even know what New Brunswick is. They think it's in New Jersey. Oh yeah, I've been to Brunswick. No, 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 I'm talking about Canada. And uh, that's where our home is. And um, so we're glad to be uh, with some fellow Canucks, amen, uh, this week. Uh, uh, Numbers chapter 14 And I want to read uh, three verses here tonight as we uh, just want us to kind of get an idea of uh, where we're headed for this revival meeting and what the Lord's laid on my heart to bring. Numbers chapter 14, and if you're able, I invite you to stand as we read the text. Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse number 22. Numbers chapter 14, verse 22. When you've got it, say amen. Amen. All right, let's jump right in. The Bible says, Because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went and his seed shall possess it. I want to preach a little bit about Caleb in these days that we have together and uh, tonight I want to look at Caleb's victory tonight. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you, God, for your grace upon us and your love, your guidance, your faithfulness uh, all through our lives. And Lord, uh, none of us have been here in this church 92 years, but you have. And uh, you certainly have been with us all through our lives, guiding us and leading us. And uh, Lord, we want to honor you with the life that you've given us. And Lord, whatever time we have remaining, Lord, we want to spend it honoring you and following your will and living life to the fullest that you would have us to live. God, we want to live a life that's pleasing to you. We want to stand before you one day and hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And so God, help us in these days as we look back upon all that you've done. Help us also to look forward upon what you still want to accomplish in and through our lives and through this church And Lord, we'll thank you and praise you for it all, give you all the glory and honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. The Bible here describes that Caleb had another spirit, another spirit. You think about that, and uh, maybe you've read this before, maybe you've read it several times before, maybe you've wondered, what is this another spirit, this other spirit that it's talking about here? Well, you know, when you compare his spirit to the spirit that the other folks had, I think you can find out what that spirit is and was. Uh, Hold your place there and go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. And uh, the Bible, I believe, will tell us uh, what this spirit is that uh, is talking about, this type of spirit that Caleb had. In Hebrews chapter 3, We read this in verse number 7, 
Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 7, the Bible says, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. When you look at the spirit that the, really the entire nation had, sadly, uh, this spirit that really characterized uh, uh, the nation was a spirit of unbelief. You know the story. They were delivered from Egyptian bondage. They were promised this land that God had set aside for them and prepared for them. And he said, all you've got to do is just follow me, go into that land, and I'll give it to you. And the Bible tells us that they went up to the land, they spied out the land. You know the story. There are 12 spies. Ten came back and gave an evil report, and only two gave a good report, Caleb and Joshua. And uh, their report was this, the, the, the evil report was this. You know, what God said, everything God said about the land of promise is true, but we can't have it. Their spirit was characterized as an unbelieving spirit. And because of that unbelief, they did not go into the land of promise. They never uh, lived in that, in that, uh, in that fullness of, of life that God had for them. Their spirit was uh, characterized by unbelief. So when you look at Caleb and you look at Joshua who was with him, uh, this other spirit I believe is a spirit of faith. I believe the spirit that Caleb had was a spirit of faith. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Listen, as you sit here in your padded pew in a nice building, and, uh, and we just ate a, a wonderful supper, and all, listen, all of these things do not happen by accident. Uh, these, the, the, the reason why we're enjoying all of this and... Uh, and, and, and so much more is because there were some people that went before us that had a spirit of faith in God that what God had promised, God would perform. And, uh, and I'm thinking about that tonight. I'm thinking about how God has blessed so much in each and every one of our lives and it's because there was, there was some people that went before us that had this spirit of faith. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look with me if you will. In verse number, uh, verse number 13, look what the scripture says. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. I love this spirit of faith. When you think about faith, you say, well, how, how do you define what faith is? A lot of people talk about faith. I'm a person of faith. I have faith. And the, it seems like that's meaning less and less. What does it mean to have faith? Well, faith is belief. It's the assent of the mind to the truth of what is, being, uh, what is uh, declared by another. So when someone says something, if you have faith in what they're saying, it's you're agreeing with them in your mind, but it's more than that. It's also resting on his authority and veracity without other evidence. So what, what, what really faith is, is faith is believing what someone else says based upon your assessment of the trustworthiness of that one that said it. Okay. And it means that you can accept what they say. This last phrase really is amazing. It says, without other evidence. Now that doesn't mean that there is no other evidence. It just means you don't need any more evidence. 
when you have true faith in, in God, and this is what we're looking at here tonight, and, and when we're considering the life of Caleb, Caleb had faith in what God said, and he didn't need any other evidence in order to believe what God said. Now, when we come to the Word of God, we understand these are God's words. We understand that they're true words. We understand that archaeology and history and all the things that they are discovering do not take away from the Word of God. They, they, they shed uh, 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 the light upon the fact that what the Bible has to say has been true all along. However, my faith tonight is not in an archaeologist. My faith is not in man's ability to keep an accurate historical record. My faith is firmly in what God has said. I do not need that other evidence to believe what God says. Caleb was this kind of man. He just believed what God had to say. It did not matter what everything else uh, was going on and, and the opposition. And uh, did not matter who was standing in the way or who said, no, this can't be true. Listen, when you think about, think about Caleb. Here's Caleb. He's one guy and Joshua, two guys, standing up against an entire nation of people. And uh, estimates are around two to three million people came out of Egypt. Two against two million. I want to talk about a minority. And they, listen, they had so much confidence in what God said that they did not back down in the face of overwhelming opposition. Two million people saying, You're wrong. And Caleb saying, I'm just believing what God said. You know what we need in these days? We talk about revival. You know what we need in these days? We need a revival of faith, simple faith in God's word. You know, preaching the word of God has worked for centuries. We don't need another method. We've got God's word and preaching the word of God will be enough. Amen. And so Caleb, he has the spirit of faith. And just two things really I want to point out to you. Number one, the majority do not have the spirit of faith. That's really sad when you think about that. The majority do not have a spirit of faith. When you think about spirit, when you look at the word of God and you see the word spirit in this context, the spirit of faith, I want you to think about this word, attitude. You don't find the word attitude in the Bible. But many times when you, when you, but you see a lot of attitude in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> Without seeing the word, you see a lot of attitude in the Bible. Many times it's described as the spirit of man. The spirit of man. I want to have an attitude of faith. Many do not have an attitude of faith when it comes to God's word, when it comes to God's promises. Think about this with me. The nation of Israel had been delivered from Egyptian bondage. Is that right? And they were delivered by faith in the blood of a lamb. Is that right? Same way we got delivered. Right? Faith in the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And so all of them had enough faith. They had faith in God to deliver them from Egypt. But only two of them had enough faith to believe that the same God who delivered them from Egypt could deliver them into the promised land. You know, as, we, as, as you go through this Christian life, as we travel and go from church to church, it's sad to see how many have enough faith for the Lord to save them, but they don't trust him to take care of the rest of his, their lives. Can I challenge you to have a spirit of faith and an attitude of faith and to believe that the, that the God that saved your never dying soul, he knows what's best for your life down here too. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus asked the question, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith on the earth? It seems like faith is going to be a very, um, a very precious commodity among people. I want to be a person 
that has true faith in the Lord. He could come back tonight. I believe that with all my heart. I want to make sure that my heart and my life is characterized as faith. I want to have a spirit of faith. You know what this church is going to need in the next 92 years? If you have 92 more years, you're going to need a spirit of faith. As the world turns against the word of God, and as, as man and man, a man gets further and further away from the Lord, there's going to be more pressure put to bear upon the people of God. And whether we're going to embrace the word of God as our final authority or not, listen, we're already experiencing that. Very simple truths that all of a sudden aren't so simple anymore in this world. What's happening? The, the, the foundation of God's word is under attack. And we need to stand up to say, hey, the whole world may believe a lie, but I'm going to believe the truth. I'm going to make sure that the word of God is my foundation. I'm going to have an attitude and a spirit of faith when it comes to the word of God and to the God of the word. The spirit of faith, uh, the majority do not have the, uh, the spirit of faith. Let me give you the second thing. The spirit of faith is a victorious spirit. Let me ask you a question here tonight. Do you believe in victory? Do you believe in victory? Do you believe that the God who delivered you from Egypt can deliver you into the promised land? You say, what's the promised land? Well, for us, for us as, as believers, the, the promised land is not a picture of heaven. No, it's a picture of the will of God. It's a picture, we often call it, it's a, it's a type of the victorious Christian life. That is, living in victory even in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Being peculiar. Now listen, I've already got a heads up, you know, a head start in being peculiar. I've got 11 kids. I'm already strange, so it doesn't even make sense for me to try to get that badge off of me. You don't have to have 11 children to be peculiar. You know, in this day and age, all you have to do is believe the Bible. And you are peculiar. You're strange. Weird. But listen, they say we're foolish. Paul said, I'll be a fool for Christ. What's foolishness to the world to us is the power of God. The preaching of the cross. To them that believe, it's the power of God. Hey, remember when someone preached to you about the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross that he died upon. How is your cross and your sins and he died on the cross and paid for all of them so that you could be saved. Remember that day that you cr trusted Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior? They might think it's foolish, but to us it was the power of God. Caleb had a spirit of faith in the word of God. He believed in victory. Listen, in this life, there's going to be temptations. There's going to be trials. There's going to be tests that come our way that we're going to have to face. But listen tonight, in Christ, there is victory. You can have victory over sin. Amen. You can have victory over self. You can have victory over fear. You can have victory over all these things that the devil wants to bring in our lives to bring us to a point of defeat. Listen, in Christ, we can have the victory. Look back just a few pages. Look at 1 Corinthians. You're in 2 Corinthians, I think, chapter 4. I am. Back at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this is a, 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 an off-quoted verse. Ver, verse number 57, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question based on this verse. How do we get victory? Through Jesus. Do we earn victory? No, the Bible says he gives it to us. So if it's not our work, then how do we access it? By faith. It's not our works. It's our faith that activates the victory that God brings into our lives. That spirit of faith is so important. God wants to give us the victory. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse number 14. Now thanks be unto God, 
which always causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Boy, did you catch that? Always causeth us to triumph in Christ. That doesn't mean that we all the time triumph. But it does mean that we can all the time triumph. The power is there. The victory is there. The opportunity is there. Do we believe that? Do you believe that God has the, has the victory, that he can give you victory over that besetting sin? Over that weight that's just pulling you down? Do you believe God can give you the victory? Amen. Listen, I'm here to tell you tonight, God can. And God will. We need to have a spirit of faith in victory. Many times we look at opposition as being the great enemy of overcoming. But listen, without opposition, there is no overcoming. You can't overcome if there's no obstacle. Is that right? So when there's obstacles and opposition in our life, that doesn't equal defeat. No, that just provides an opportunity for God to show himself mighty on our behalf. Talking about faith, a spirit of faith. Look back in Numbers chapter 13. A couple more scriptures here I want us to look at. Numbers chapter 13. Everybody doing okay? Eating all this food, sitting in a nice warm building, and now you want to go to sleep. Hang on, hang on. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Probably out of context. Numbers chapter 13. We read chapter 14 where it said that that uh, Caleb had another spirit with him. Look at Numbers 13, look at verse number 26. And they went, this is the, uh, the 12 spies, they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel under the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites uh, dwelt in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea, by the coast of Jordan. You see this? They're getting all worked up. They're all focused upon the opposition and upon the ones that are against them. Listen, we do have an enemy. The devil. He's our enemy. The people of this world, they're not our enemy. But many of them are pawns in his hand. And he's using them. And he's using governments and he's using laws to try to... Try to uh, 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 bring our, our, our faith to a, to a, a point of, of contention and, and the way we raise our children, that's under attack these days. All these things being brought to bear, the pressure being brought to bear against the people of God, and you know, if we're not careful, we'll start just getting focused upon all the problems and all the opposition and forget about God. And notice what Caleb does here in verse number 30. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. You know what he said? Listen, hey, you're looking at all the wrong places. Let's go forward. Our God is able to give us this land. He says in in chapter 14, verse 8, if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. Listen, do you understand that when we do not have a spirit of faith in God and a spirit of, of, of victory, that God has, can, uh, has offered us the victory and will deliver us the victory, when we don't have that, we are rebelling against God. We have this idea that unbelief is not a bad sin. But you do understand that unbelief was the sin that kept them from going to the promised land. 
Now listen, it was, by far it was not the only sin they committed. You check the record, they committed just about every sin you can think of in that, in that wilderness. Over, over the span of 40 years in that wilderness, they committed a lot of different sins, but it was this sin, one sin of unbelief that kept them out of the land of promise. That's how serious that is in God's eyes. Listen, we're called by his name. We're his people. If anybody should have faith in God, it should be us. Do you believe in victory tonight? Do you believe that the best days of this church are still ahead for it? Unbelief focuses on the enemies. Faith focuses on God's promise. Our victory is found in faith. We believe, uh, listen, we believe based on what we hear, God's word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's one reason why it's so important to have meetings like this. That's why it's important that you be in church every Sunday and every time the doors are open, you need to be here. Why? Because these are faith building sessions. This is time for God to build your faith in him. Because you know we're combating the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the week. We're hearing about all the stuff of the world. You're not hearing about how great your God is on Fox News. Or CNN. Or CBC. Can I say that still? Not go to jail? You're not, listen, you're not getting your faith built out there. This is where your faith is built. You need to hear the word of God. Caleb had faith in the word of God. He believed that God would give them the victory. Faith recognizes that the presence of God outweighs any opposition. No, Moses said, Lord, if you go with us, we'll win. But if if your presence isn't with us, we don't even want to go. Amen. I get up in this pulpit to preach and that's the prayer on my lips I don't want to go out there without you Lord you know what that should be our attitude whatever we're doing when we're raising our little ones for the glory of God we ought to be saying Lord you've got to help me with this I don't even want to do this without your presence God's presence makes all the difference you go into a church where the presence of God is my What a difference that makes. You go into a church where Ichabod's over the door, my, what a difference that makes. The glory of God's departed. Surely we don't want that to be said of this church. The presence of God is what sets this place apart. Caleb understood that God was with them and he knew that God being with them meant that they had the victory. Tonight, do we have the spirit of faith? Are we ready to march forward in faith and in victory in our own lives, in our families, in our church? First John chapter five, we'll look at one more scripture here. First John chapter five. In 1 John chapter 5, look at verse number 4. Scripture says this, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Not our resources, Not our abilities, not our wisdom, our faith. You know what this world needs to see? It needs to see people like you and I, the people of God, to just getting back to the place where we have complete faith in our God. That if he says something in his word, that he will give us the strength to fulfill that in our lives. We don't have to live 
like we used to live in Egypt. That God's delivered us from that. That God's given us the victory. Again, I want to ask you the question tonight. Do you believe in victory? Do you believe that greater is he that's within us than he that's within the world? I believe that. Caleb believed that. He had another spirit. It was a spirit of faith. And the spirit of faith says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word tonight. And God, I pray that we would take some time in these days, in the busyness of life, that we would just set aside some time to dwell upon your word, to dwell upon the simple truths of your word. And understand that what you say in your word, they're not just empty, they're not just feel good. That your word is powerful. And that your promises are sure. And that the victory that we need for our own lives, for our families, for our churches, for our nation is found in you. And accessed by simple faith. Lord, thank you for men like Caleb and others through history. Women that just believed you. They just took you at your word. Did not matter the circumstance. It did not matter the opposition. Did not matter the naysayers. I'm sure that Bethel Baptist Church has had plenty of naysayers down through the years. But Lord, thank you for a group of people that just believe the word of God and just trusted you to provide and to lead and to guide. And Lord, here, 92 years later, down the road, We still have a faithful God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. I do believe tonight that there's more victory than what I'm currently living in. And so God help me by faith To believe not only that you can, but that you will grant each and every one of us victory for each day as we just simply by faith read your word, believe it, and obey it. Lord, maybe there's someone here tonight who's never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation. And Lord, I pray that tonight they would understand that it doesn't take a certain educational level or financial ability. Lord, that it's not just one certain group of people that can be saved, but you open the way for all. You said, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Lord, tonight if there's one in this place that is never in faith called out to you to save them. May they do so tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would guide us through these days of meetings that have been set aside. Help us to worship you. Help us to enjoy the fellowship of the believers. And help us, dear God, to have a revival of faith in you in your word, and in your plan for our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Pastor, you come.